welcome back to another episode of Two Witnesses Live. We have an exciting show for you guys today. We are going to continue the conversation from yesterday about the steps that we can take in order to heal the nation, heal the divided nation. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, conversation about, you know, the effects that can happen to a country, uh, to a land based on the people and what they're doing. So given where we are and where we've come from, this is this is like a really important topic that we want to continue to to really hammer home. And the the objective is to, you know, come out of this with tools, uh, number one, to be encouraged, uplifted, and come out of this with the tools that we can actually use to help people uh, in, in these hard times. So that's really the objective. But also, uh, there was a a bombshell of a video that was dropped today where Trump dropped a 10-point plan about how he's going to root out the deep state. So I thought that might be interesting to to talk about. I don't know if you guys got to watch that. We may play it if, if everybody doesn't know what it is. Did you guys get to see that video? I saw a portion of it where he was talking about, you know, the chemical castration of our of our youth and stuff, but... I was kind of I saw I went to his website and I looked at it and I saw that it was posted there. But when I was watching it on, I believe the YouTube, it said a year ago it was listed. So I wasn't yep, sure there if was, that was recent or no. There's yeah, the, he just posted it today. It's three minutes long, so it's a ten point plan on what he's going to do the day he starts. Okay. That's um, something different. Yeah, then. yeah. So I'll go through the the bullet points and maybe we can listen to it. So um, talk about that and then if we have time today. Um, we have some, um, how do you say this, a very, very exciting possibility for the two witnesses. So this is something that uh, Yas Blaine has been working on for over a year, uh, and I finally just understood it last night. After after the show, we had just the most amazing conversation. We literally should have recorded it because it was just like, you know, aha moments left and right. It was absolutely amazing. So if we have time, we'll get into that. But this is one of those ones that we want to spend some time on, uh, going through the scripture, building it up. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. So with all of that, why don't we go around and introduce ourselves? We'll start with David. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, let's see. My name is David Sepulveda. What do I do? I'm a father of four. Um, I, I actually work uh, with the state of Wisconsin. I'm a government employee, been so for like five years. I also, I wrote a book uh, during COVID, wrote a book to my kids uh, since my wife was uh, working and taking classes online, told me I had to stop talking to her. So I wrote a book uh, to put all my talking onto paper and gave it to my kids. And then I also work as an executive consultant uh, with View Excellence. Uh, that's a little bit about me. That's awesome. So another thing about David is actually we went to college together. So David is one of my most favorite people on the entire planet. Uh, it's it's kind of like uh, uh, reconnecting with your, your childhood bully. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those relationships. Huh? <laughs> I'm not no, sure which one of us was the bully. <laughs> No, David was funny, but man, he he really did the pranks. We'll have to tell some stories about some of the stuff he got large quantities of people doing, like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we can talk about that. But uh, before we get into uh, any of those kind of stories, why don't we continue going? Uh, Gregory, why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? Sure, my name's Greg. I uh, have a YouTube channel called Yasplain. That's Y-A-H-S-P-L-A-I-N. Go to YouTube and be sure to subscribe there and have probably close to 200 videos over the past five years of just researching and studying that I have done and from many aspects of life and challenge, it'll guarantee to challenge your paradigm. So make sure you make sure you do that. Don't don't throw any chairs after you watch a few of my videos, but make sure you uh, take the time to challenge your paradigm. I think we all have to do that as we go through life and understanding because the father reveals stuff to us all the time if we stay meek and humble and he will surely bless us when we do that so yeah totally paul who are you what do you do yep and i am paul and many of you know me as uh 
moderator. I've been with two witnesses live pretty close to the inception, not quite. Uh, I'm retired and I live up in northern Minnesota, neighbor to Dave. And uh, I'm looking forward to tonight's show. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So what do you guys remember from last night? Where do we want to pick up? So we went to, uh, what was it, Second Chronicle 7? Uh, what else did we get into? Jeremiah? Or Isaiah 1, was it? Yeah, Isaiah 1. Yep. And so that was where consequences of... Here, let me uh, share this. Actually, uh, just a, a note on um, my YouTube channel. I just did a... I kind of did a, a video... A, Regarding Isaiah, if you read Isaiah chapter one through chapter five, there's very there's quite a few references to the last days, and so what I did with that video, I just strung verses together, didn't really, you know, add a lot of context to it, but just kind of hit notes on every time he brought up the last days and kind of going through, you know, understanding the perspective of the prophet that's writing here for his nation. You know, he, you can just see his heart pouring out for his nation and stuff. And, and, you know, saying, because you've done this, because you've done this, this is why you are scattered. This is why you have been um, bruised. This is why you're, the head is sick. The whole body is sick. And so he kind of goes into that through, um, starting in chapter one through five. So I encourage people to, to read that whole, uh, section of scriptures, chapters one through five, and gives you a lot of stuff on the last days. Yeah. And then two, I think a, a good point just for the Bible researchers out there is last days of what? So a lot of times um, we have to understand context when it comes to scriptures as far as, because the day of the Lord is actually referenced three or four times within the Old Testament Tanakh scriptures. And so there are times when it's referring to actual judgment upon Israel or Judah at that point in time, and it's calling it the day of the Lord. And so we, I think, maybe tie the New Testament day of the Lord into something else. So there could be a day of the Lord, the day of judgment um, during the time of the temple destruction. You know, and I I see that a lot of what Revelation is, is a... Um, a connection to that because it's a lot of temple language within the book of Revelation, looking into the to the heavenly temple and kind of using that comparison, um, because that's what it talks about in Revelation eleven about the two witnesses, the uh, measuring the temple, and the and the nations being in the outside of the court. So yeah, you know it's interesting. Also, uh, that temple. Do you think it's a physical temple or do you think it's the uh, the First Corinthians three sixteen where you are the temple of God? you know, no, you're not that you are the temple of God. So we, we've become the temple of God. Is, is that the temple, the temple that you think is being measured there? Well, I think there's aspects of that. And that's some of our discussions last night was talking about, you know, I had mentioned that revelation, you know, he's having a vision. So whenever prophets are having visions, if you look at Daniel, Isaiah, a lot of times you'll see references to the night because they're looking up to the stars. And so if you'll recall that Moses was given instructions to um, build the tabernacle, to arrange it like the temple, like like heaven, essentially. And so that's kind of our mirror in, in, a, in a certain aspect, certain respect. And so that's the outer space temple. And then we have the earthly temple that was built by Solomon. And then we have the inner space temple. And that's what I, we were discussing last night is, you know, I see that as when a person gets born again, we are dethroning Satan from his seat in, in our lives. You know, we're no longer children of disobedience, but we allowed the Messiah and the Father to dwell within us. So I think there's there's so many layers to that um, within Revelation. But I do see that as him looking, John is looking up into the temple. He sees the seven stars, the seven visible planets that act kind of like a menorah and you know and that's what the messiah holds the menorah in his hand so he's holding the planets he's holding the gods he's holding those deities in a sense that are over the nations saying i am over the nations now and so that's kind of what happens with us in internally spiritually is we dethrone the adversary 
and he's kicked out of heaven, out of the mind, um, the temple. And it's interesting that Messiah says, keep your um, treasures in heaven. The word treasures is thesaurus. And so it's like really the book, like the book. It's, it's a book of words, right? Mm -hmm. So we have words in our mind. And so that's kind of one of those parallels um, with that outer space versus inner space is that we keep the, the word, the treasures, the thesaurus of the Father's words in our mind. And, you know, we, we dethrone the enemy whenever he attacks. That's putting on that, that righteousness, the mind of Messiah. I love that because it goes into what we were talking about with narcissism and the spirit of Antichrist to where as, like, how, how else do you keep God in your temple but except for to read his word? When you read his word and you, you look at, uh, even just looking at the stories and the records for what happened to people and how they reacted, um, since we've started looking at this idea of narcissism uh, being, you know, parallel to the spirit of Antichrist, it's starting to, it opens up the entire scripture because you start to see these narcissistic tendencies in people to where they have this God complex, right? To where they, you know, their behavior is selfish. It's, it's, it's inwardly focused to where they want to do things that serve themselves, where when you see Christ, he did things that served others. I mean, like you're talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he's washing the feet of his disciples. That is a service mindset. And you know, when you look at that with the, 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 the two commandments, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, that's the mindset that you want to have. So this has kind of been the conversation that we've, that we've had, you know, for the last couple of days. And, you know, I see that as that's how you allow God to be in your temple. So when, when you keep the, you know, keep these things in your mind, and honestly, I think this is what is needed in order to, we lost Gregory. <laughs> I think this is what is needed in order to heal the nation going forward. I was thinking, you know, when we were talking about healing the nation, uh, some of the scripture was saying that we need to uh, love on each other and we need to move away from the selfishness. You know, the term narcissist to me is really important from a searching standpoint. You can access information a lot easier searching narcissism or narcissist than you can by searching selfish. But I think that's what we really mean is, is selfish. Yeah. Um, that, you know, and, and so, you know, use it as a search term, but I, in healing the nation, I think uh, kind of the action items from that first video are really brought up again of know what the traits are. Uh, it helps with discernment, but we can also look at ourselves see what uh what's a challenge for us personally and and then uh we're more cognizant of it we can better deal with those things and move more into uh, a situation where we love our neighbors which is what god calls us to do and it's what we need to do to heal the nation yeah agreed so david you your book is your uh can you tell us a little bit more about your book because i think your book kind of relates to some of this because you've done an amazing job raising a family you've got some you know really successful techniques to make your children successful and i think those things when 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 you have a god focused mindset produces good people and i think that relates specifically to you know your neighbor you know the people around you um, what, so what do you think about this stuff? So, you know, can you, can you speak to some of your experience maybe and some of the, some of the things that, some of the principles that you've learned, um, along the lines of love God and love your neighbor and how it relates to how, you know, tools that people can actually apply in their lives? Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you say that because, uh, I spent a good portion of my life researching the Bible and even having home fellowships and trying to help as many people as I could. And then uh, I got out of the church and I started in corporate world. And I started uh, helping businesses and it led me into management. And, it, and all of a sudden, all of these skills that I had developed and knowing from the word, I started seeing practical application. 
what I wasn't allowed to do was I wasn't allowed to quote scripture. And the people I had to deal with were having everyday problems all the time. And what I had to do was find ways to explain practic the practicality of the Word of God without going into all of the actual scripture, because it was work. If I start quoting scripture at work, poof, get out of here. Yeah, we don't want to hear it. This is not a church, right? You Bible so, basher. Yeah, you know, it's called a thumper and all the other words, you know, you hear out there. Uh, but what I found was the way that I helped my children was the same way I ended up helping all of my direct reports. And I went from having two, three direct reports to 30 to 50 direct reports. Uh, and what I found is that most people don't know themselves and they can't even separate what this body, what it entails from what is spirituality. What is, what is that separation? Most people are so concerned with trying to conform this body into doing right, into being perfect, into how do I uh, not have this flaw? This body is flawed. There's no way around it. We all know it. And when we think of confession made unto salvation, it's a matter of accepting that and not getting prideful and thinking about, uh, well, I need to look a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way. I, it's more about, I need to learn to control that mindset. What is that mindset and how am I allowing things to influence me? And I, I feel like when I'm working with my children at home, when I'm working with people at work, I, st I steadily focus on their strengths. And as I focus on their strengths, they like hearing that. They love hearing that. I tell them, hey, you did this. This is amazing. And you have a strength in communication. You have a strength in attention to detail. And that gets me the open door to then they listen. They hear what I'm saying. And it's in acknowledging what your actual strengths are that you'll start seeing the differences. You'll start seeing, oh, well, I'm really good at this one thing. Like, oh, let's say I'm really good at communication. Well, you know what? I talk too much. You can't really separate the two, right? right? So if I have a strength that's coming with an opportunity and teaching that to my kids led them to seeing their sibling having a different strength than they had. And then that opened the opportunity for them to say, oh, I'm not really good at fixing stuff, but my brother Jacob, man, he takes things apart, figures it out, puts it right back together. Oh, but Gabriel, Gabriel, he's really good at memorizing. And when it comes to doing mathematics, that kid, he's just got an, a mind for numbers. So with raising my children, it was the same way I led people in organizations, was focus on that strength, keep feeding that strength. And then as those opportunities come in, you make room for acknowledging them, being transparent with them, and then asking for help. Because whether we believe it or not, we're all connected. We're all connected. So we have to help each other. But yeah. You think of a body, you got white blood cells, red blood cells, you need them all. Dave, did you, did you find that uh, that kind of focus helped build teamwork within your, within your group? Yes. Yes, immeasurably. I I managed a bank for years, and I found that I had certain tellers that were really good with getting the details of our audits down. And then I had other tellers that they could talk to individuals and find needs and refer them to better their finances. I worked with a credit union, not a, a bank, but I mean, they both are trying to do the same thing. And uh, it, it's really the people that are working it that make the difference. And the, once they started seeing the strengths and acknowledging their own and seeing the strengths in someone else, uh, it really turned into uh, uh, the best teams. It really was. People started to 
make room for, oh, that's just David. You know David. He talks a lot. and But he usually has something good to say, right? And then people were more forgiving. I find that most people aren't so upset when they find out I have an opportunity. They're upset if they think I don't know I have an opportunity. Once they know I know it, ah, yeah, he's a good man. He's trying. Um, oh, shoot. I had a... I it did... Ah, I'll c come back to me. I had a question I wanted to ask, but I, I'll remember it here in a second. Yeah, you know, e even things like that, where yeah, the me learning that I had a, an issue like that with, with when I'm trying to engage in a conversation, I had to learn that I didn't have an internal dialogue. My dialogue is external. I think really? I start talking, and I don't know how I'm going to end when I start talking. So one thing I do, I don't know if you noticed, but I have a pen and paper, and when I get thoughts, I have to write them down, or they stay right in that uh, the docking station of the head, right? And nothing can get in, and nothing can get out. Uh, but if I have a pen and paper, it gives me a little practical thing I can do, and now when people see it, because I admit it, they know, hey, I've just got a pen and paper, because uh, this conversation is important to me. How how did the people that you were working with uh, feel about themselves and about each other, uh, realizing, you know, the different strengths? It, well, what we did, was, and this is interesting because when we look at religion and churches, I don't know that we tap into this so much. Uh, but when you go to business, they know it. They know it so much that they send their employees to trainings. Right, you can go online and check out uh, where did I see Strength Finder, Gallup Strength Finder, uh, and they'll ask you a bunch of silly questions, and you, it's like, do I like doing, uh, do I like being honest, or do I like to consider other people's feelings? They're both great things, but which one do I lean more toward? Right, and by answering those questions, you get like this list of oh, this is what I do, and this is the strength. This is what you rely on for success. Well, once you start sharing that with people, they start seeing. It's almost like they're exposed, but in a good way. It's like exposed and put up on a pedestal. You do, and you'll see the glisten in their eye. They're like, yeah, you're right. I do do that. And usually it gets me in trouble, but I guess it's good too. Yeah, right. So it sounds like you learned. What ages are your kids? Oh, go ahead. My kids, uh, my kids are 22. It's my oldest, 20, 18, and 15. I have three beautiful boys, and a, my last is my daughter. Uh, and the three boys are biological with me and my wife, and then we did foster care and adopted my daughter here locally in Wisconsin. Uh, so we finally got the girl and I got the picker at that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah. Nice. Wow. It, so it sounds like you've uh, learned a lot of techniques for empathy, for seeing the best in other people and identifying areas where, where you can help them. There's, there's been so much that is, this, that has happened in our nation just over the last seven years. So I say seven years because I'm starting my timeline from the Revelation 12 sign, right? So we there was a period of time where we had, you know, the Trump administration. Things were pretty good. I know I, I was doing very well. A lot of people I know were doing very well. Um, I had more friends on Facebook during that time. And then come in the next administration, and I started losing friends. So you, needless to say, there's a lot of division that has happened uh, between, you know, the switch over between those two administrations. And man, these last four years have been really hard. Uh, what do you, do you have any recommendations for uh, that we can do to maybe start to um, reconcile with people, you know, maybe you block some people on Facebook, <laughs> maybe you've said some mean things, maybe they said mean things to you. Do you have a, uh, uh, what are your guys' recommendations for, um, I'm a big fan of, of forgiveness. This is one of the things that 
I always had an issue with uh, with the church when I was growing up is um, they never gave they didn't give people an opportunity. They didn't forgive people. Right. It's just like there was this idea of marking and avoiding people. It's just like we're done with you. We're ostracizing you. And that's never sat well with me. So it's just like I'm constantly revisiting like so what this has shaped who I am probably negatively in some regards, because I have a tendency to try to help narcissists a little too much. <laughs> but what do, do what 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 advice do you guys have for those situations for, you know, hurt feelings, um, situations that, you know, where they haven't forgiven you? Um, what do we do? What do we how do we start reconciling with people that for things that have happened over the last couple of years, and maybe even people who are mad for who you voted for during you know, just a couple of days ago. For me, I find forgiveness a lot easier if I do kind of one of two things. And this is really important to get good at forgiving. But uh, one is if I understand a bit on why they did what they did, and I don't have to agree with it, but to understand them better, I, you know, they say they're an athlete and they were uh, challenging and challenging me or something that bothered me. Well, they're competitive and they were just being themselves. Uh, and it makes it easier to forgive them if you understand why they did what they did. Uh, and the other thing, too, is to realize that I'm not the judge. That's God's that's God's business right there. I, uh, and I'm just going to step aside because there's a way better judge than me. So I just, you know, let it go and move on. I have some dear friends of mine that they have a strength in memory. They have the ability to memorize obnoxious amounts of scripture, codes. They can memorize you you can ask them, well, when did you learn this? And they'll tell you the date, the time, who was there, what they were wearing. Uh, and I find that when you have that strength of memory, that the opportunity for uh, for having difficulty with forgiveness is so prominent. Because you can remember the looks on their face. You can remember the, the tone of voice, the stature, the, the aggression. You can remember all of that, right? And then you have to get rid of that. Now, obviously, forgiveness is not equal to forgetting, right? But the more intense that memory is, the, the more difficult it is to then allow someone the grace to be forgiven, right? To allow yourself to not carry that that negative vibration with you to not carry the that sting that scar that's you know that you think no one can see it but it's there everyone sees it right and i feel that what i've learned is that when it comes to forgiveness uh it really is a matter of looking at ourselves because we we look at that forget that that uh, negative occurrence, what happened to me? I, I, we look at that and think there's no, sorry. So when you look at yourself, you think of how crappy you were and it helps you forgive. <laughs> I'm so much worse than them. I think I can forgive them this one little thing. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Uh, but I, I, I feel what I've come to terms with is with looking within at what, the baggage that it, it weighs me down, it doesn't allow me to enjoy uh, the moment that I'm in. Like, have you ever been in a room with someone that you still haven't quite forgiven? You can't enjoy the room. You can't smile at the person next to you. You have to avoid eye contact. And that's all baggage that you're carrying. And I, I think yeah. we get so hung up in thinking that we all share the same universe and we don't. We don't. And you can see it when you watch teams come together. You have that one person that's energetic and everything is great. And then you have the pessimist. And then you have the person who's not even really there. 
they're all in different worlds. And we have to look at our world because that's what we have power over. That's renewed mind. That's renewed mind is keeping the, the eyes on what am I, what's going on in my noggin? What's, what am I, how am I feeling? And when I start looking at that, that's what encourages me to forgive. I don't want to carry that. Uh, so I think I got a little off track with your question. I know your question yeah. was, how do I go to forgiving those? It, it really is listening to their story. Yeah. Well, uh, empathizing. I mean, you're describing empathy. So you're, you're listening to, you know, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Like, so a, a good example is uh, during the pandemic, people got very um, convicted uh, in, in what they believed, and it started causing, you know, conflicts with one another. You know, you get two people who believe something very strongly, strong words will be said. And understanding from that perspective that they, they, they felt very strongly one thing you could do is you could you could approach them and go, do you still feel that? Do you still feel the same way? That's probably a good icebreaker. <laughs> but putting yourself in their shoes, uh, it sounds like you're saying is is putting yourself in their shoes um, so that you can start to approach, you know, what they're going through and seeing things from their perspective, which is well, a- empathy as, as far as I know. Very similar to what you just did right there. Uh, you listened to what I said and you said it back to me to confirm right? That's communicating. That makes me feel like I was heard. And we've gotten away from that. We've gotten to a point where we all have something to say, and we just need someone to pause, and then I'm going to say it. And being able to listen and be there in the moment, that's, that's where the key is. That's where then people realize, oh, you do care about me. And once they know you care, then they want to listen to who you are. Amen. Do you want to you want to jump in on this, uh, Gregory? Any tools or tips for how we can uh, uh, like? So, what are some? Sorry, what are some action items that we can uh, employ for moving forward, for forgiving people and and healing the divide? You know, it's. Uh, I think that what David was saying is like no one cares what you know until they know that you care, and it's that's always. I think. Well, especially like when you know we're talking about politics, people get highly like we haven't seen this. At least I haven't in my lifetime as far as the behavior. And I think part of it too. I I ask this question: like, is are things like terribly going bad? Are people like this bad, or are things really as bad as they seem? Or is there a little bit of hyperbole in the fact that we have internet, we have all of this access? going on to to hear people complain, to hear people with their perspectives and points of views. And I think it can be a little bit heightened more than than what we're used to just because we have we have more access. So for example, if if you watch something that on TV or the internet about Trump or Kamala or whoever, and say a million people share or have seen that and like that, that's only 1 million out of 330 million people that right. share that idea or that perspective. So it's really maybe not that as big and as blown out as we probably perceive it to be. These people are going crazy. And you see, I think you see that like within in the Internet. It's like if, you know, a few people, a few clips go viral, not everybody thinks that or not everybody has that same mentality even if they vote for the other side that doesn't mean them and i've i said this many times the the generalization fallacy is huge when it comes to you know putting people in groups and i think that's kind of something that we can can try to do as individuals and uh, collectively is not to call people names in a sense like labels i you know i'm guilty of that but you know, we say the Christians, the Jews, the the left, the right. You know, we we categorize that, and you know, like Christianity has over thirty thousand, forty thousand denominations. It's the largest religion in the world. Is so is that the narrow walk 
you know, how is that so narrow if that if that's the case? And so we have to really reflect just on ourselves. And that goes back to what the Messiah says about, you know, the moat in your own eye and stuff. And I, but I think that's that's kind of one thing is not to hyperventilate when we do see or hear something that's that's kind of crazy. And yeah. like Dave says, listen. It's like, okay, listen to people's perspective, even if it's crazy. You know, that's why, you know, we'd have debates and stuff. And that's, I think, a challenge is we, um, you know, watch debates or something and everybody's got their side and they, you know, they want to run off to the other side and not listen to the other side, you know, just shout them down. You know, and that's that's obviously a, a left thing that we see, but it, that's not for everybody. You know, not everybody. There are people that would like to engage and that are involved. So, but I think that's that's kind of where I am. I think is not having labeling people and looking for, uh, like Dave said, just list, list, hearing people out all the way through. Because try to understand, well, why why do you believe that? Tell me more. You know, where do you, where do you come from? Yeah, and and that makes a lot of sense too. Because you're right. Like uh, the internet has really thrown a lot of information at people and it makes it hard to differentiate between you know what's right and what's wrong and it's very easy for small groups of people to have very large voices um and i think we saw that a lot this these this last four years to where it was hard to know what to believe uh but there sure were some you know small groups of people that were swaying large large groups of people um so uh, definitely something that we can do is get your facts straight, you know, get your information, um, you know, maybe from more than one resource. Uh, I, I know personally, we were looking at a lot of different resources, uh, especially with the legacy media, you know, traditionally you used to be able to turn on the TV and uh, listen to Fox news or CNN or MSNBC. And, you know, it was trustworthy information, uh, but, I feel that we saw that that legacy system uh, is highly, is highly, but yeah, so it's just like, be careful not to, you know, overly rely on your, your news source. We're, we're in an age now where research is necessary, uh, where something that I think was exposed in the last four years is how easy information is to manipulate. Something I wanted to add, you know, Dave, it, well, everybody's kind of saying, listen, but remember when Dave was talking about, I, I don't know if Dave's still here with us. I hope he is. But, I am. Oh, okay. When you were talking about strengths, I, that's kind of more, a lot of times strength is more of an action or a, you, uh, as opposed to words, you know, he can do this well or do that well. I. Uh, but I think that also involves listening and, and seeing, you know, it, it, noticing might be a better word, but it's really noticing who they are. Yeah. I, I think helps a lot with that uh, love connection, you know, recognizing who our brother is. Yeah, definitely. And so, uh, David, I'm going to let you respond and then we're going to pivot into our next segment. Sure. That that's definitely what it is. It's we have been put in these uh I call it a meat sack, but I've heard other people call meat cars. And we have to learn how how this car operates. And some of our cars pull to the right, some of us uh need extra oil, and we have to figure out how to be successful and those successes that we've had starting at birth from child birth to child to adolescence, teenagers, all the way up to adults, we've created these habits and this is what works. And that's what's brought us success. We've done it over and over because of the success. And acknowledging that we have that helps people feel comfortable in who they are. Hmm. Yeah. It does. It makes people feel comfortable in who they are. I like that. So I'm kind of curious on your guys' thoughts on Trump's plan. So speaking of, um, you know, information manipulation, small groups, you know, having a, a large voice, Trump today, Donald Trump, uh, put out a video 
about his 10 point plan on what he's going to do to try and help fix that. Did you guys want to watch that? Play a couple clips of it. Yeah, let's yeah, do that. Let's watch it. Let's yes. see how this works. Audio. See that? Now let's see if everybody can hear it. Here's my plan to dismantle the deep state. First, I will immediately reissue my 2020 executive order restoring the president's authority to remove rogue bureaucrats. Second, we will clean out all of the corrupt actors in our national security and intelligence apparatus. The departments and agencies that have been weaponized will be completely overhauled. Third, we will totally reform FISA courts. Fourth, we will establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to declassify and publish all documents on deep state spying, censorship, and corruption. Fifth, we will launch a major crackdown on government leakers. Sixth, we will make every inspector general's office independent and physically separated from the departments they oversee. Seventh, I will ask Congress to establish an independent auditing system to continually monitor our intelligence agencies to ensure they are not spying on our citizens or running disinformation campaigns against the American people, or that they are not spying on someone's campaign like they spied on my campaign. Eighth, move parts of the sprawling federal bureaucracy to new locations outside the Washington swamp. Ninth, I will work to ban federal bureaucrats from taking jobs at the companies they deal with and that they regulate. Finally, I will push a constitutional amendment to impose term limits on members of Congress. This is how I will shatter the deep state and restore government that is controlled by the people and for the people. Thank you very much. Wow. So 10 points. Uh, when I was listening to that, I was wondering if that's not potentially the head wound um, of the beast that's talked about in Revelation 13. Do you guys know what I'm referring to? Yeah. Yeah. So in Revelation 13, uh, there's two beasts that are mentioned. Uh, the first one is the beast from the sea with seven heads, 10 horns, and 10 crowns. That beast is very likely some kind of a government uh, with leaders, uh, as is the other one. Uh, the beast from the sea means it's probably, it seems to be that it may be referring to a uh, a government that rises from the people, uh, from among the people. Uh, me personally, I'm looking at the United Nations for that. So, I don't know if I'm right about that. It's just what I'm what I'm looking for. And uh, the beasts. So, but it's so it's interesting when you listen to his his checklist here. Um, the reason why I think this applies to what we've been talking about is. You know, you're you're talking about the things. I feel like so much evil was exposed during the last four years. Uh, the way that they attacked him uh, with 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 frivolous lawsuits. I mean, things that were literally outside of the statute of limitations that were not misdemeanors that had you know already that had very little evidence were used against him in multiple cases. Uh, likewise, people on the different platforms uh, were. I, I know personally, I got banned. Um, on, uh, you know, different platforms before, you know, things kind of got a little bit better there. Um, so he's, he's, it seems to have a plan to fix the things that have been happening over the last four years. And those things seem like they're going to have a massive impact on the government. Uh, what do you guys think? Uh, well, specifically noting um, the information we were talking about, the legacy media, because number five was a major crackdown on government uh, leakers who collude with fake news. Um, and there were a couple of other ones in there, too, like that. First thing I heard was unemployment. I, I really up. like he's, that he's going at it this way. You know, one of the things I'm looking forward to is cutting the budget and get, getting rid of government waste. But I think what uh, we see as waste is, uh, you know, kind of this deep state in there. They want to do their things. It's really not for the people or for the benefit of the country. It's what they want to do. And when you rearrange the the uh, authority structure within the country that way, not outside the bounds or, you know, not really even uh, becoming a constitutional issue, I don't think. But he, he is rearranging the authority structure. 
and he's getting rid of a lot of garbage we just don't need. Agreed. Yeah, I mean, that's there's some things in there that are kind of scary. Like uh, he's reissuing uh, the given uh, restoring the president's authority to remove rogue bureaucrats. I, I can imagine people are going to think that he's going to abuse that, but I can see the necess- the necessity of that kind of power. Um, so a lot of these things I could see, you know, being positive or negative. Uh, but given his previous administration, he it seemed like he did good things. This this our the pre- the administration that we're currently under, they did a lot of bad things. This sounds like a list that is beneficial and can help fix some of the problems. And it's very interesting given the times that we're living in. When I hear that, when I listen to what we just played, I think of accountability. And I know that, uh, I got to say it, I live in an area where there are not a lot of Trump supporters. Uh, And... Uh, and they're, those are people that I truly love. There are people that I love here that I spend lots of time with and share my heart with and uh, help their families in all these different uh, areas of life that where they find difficulty. And yet, when I hear what Trump says, I can see how they start to, there, there's, there's fear growing and 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 we we know that fear or at least most of us have heard fear being false evidence appearing real right and it's only in observing the environment that they're in acknowledging where they're at and what's going on that you can have an impact on their trajectory on where they're going in their life it a lot of us like to go and give advice and say well this is what you should do and most of the time when people are in fear mode, they are not listening. They, but if you can point out, look at what's good, look at what's going on with your life, uh, those points are what are is going to calm people down. I, peace comes from uh, calming your emotions, of having your emotions uh, equal to the person next to you. When when their emotions are opposite of yours, you don't have peace. That's where you start, conflict starts, right? So when you're with, when I find myself with my friends, my loved ones who don't agree with what I agree with, I find that I have to slow down and I have to try and see what they're seeing and ask them questions about their environment and that gets them to exhale. It gets blood to start moving around to the brain uh, to where they're not in that panic state. And I feel like that holding accountable that Trump is doing, we need that. We want that. Uh, and we've ha- had it go too far the wrong way. Uh, and not in a right left thing, in a I'm not going to speak up when I think something's wrong. I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to manage the fight. We have to change that. We have to get to where we love someone enough to help them see what's going on. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had to teach my daughter that those people that don't correct you, they don't love you. They're just mm-hmm. waiting for you to go cross the street in front of someone else's house. They don't want you to. They don't want to deal with it in front of their house. And yeah. it, that correction, we have to get back to that. But we also have to learn and teach people to see correction as love, not as, you know, this is the lashing. No, that's definitely not it. But David, you had you, you made a very good point, slowing down. Um, so often I think people get so emotionally whipped up about what they feel. And if if just one party can slow down and listen to the other person and empathize with them from their perspective, and then, you know, I find that asking really good questions, because nobody likes to say yes, everybody likes to say no. So, uh, and, and nobody wants to be told that they're wrong or wants to be told what to do. Um the, the more that we can listen and ask questions, I think the more that we can uh, persuade people over to our 
are, you know, things that have convinced us uh, to believe what it is that we believe. Um, it, you know, if you get into a pissing contest, uh, you know, the person with the, the, the who's drank the most is going to be the one who wins. The, <laughs> the one who survives the longest is going to be the one who wins. Uh, and that's not, you know, that's not the, that's not the right way to, uh, to heal, you know, relationships and, and uh, go forward, uh, especially with loving your neighbor as yourself. But that, oh, here's Yas Blaine trying to come back in again. No, what I heard from, uh, from President Trump was unemployment's about to go up. Unemployment. Oh, Talked about yeah. getting rid of all of those people. The bureaucracy, the, bu the, the bureaucrats the, the bureaucracy. and the government agencies. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people will be looking for jobs. You know, well, I mean, and, true. Go ahead. There's a fry cook position I think that opened up. What is it? I saw actually, actually a meme on I, when it, it had uh, President Trump and Elon sitting across the table saying, "What is it that you do here?" <laughs> from Office from... Space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually Government talking. I was actually talking with uh, some of my uh, coworkers. And uh, that was one of their concerns, actually, was what will it do to the economy in that area, right? And for sure, there's going to need to be some thought put into that because you can't take away all those jobs and all that money that's being spent and not expect for there to be some type of an impact. And at the same time, you can't fear change. Change is inevitable. I kind of uh, wonder how much yet, those people make though Holy. i think for like it's still somewhat concerning at least you know i i watch the markets and try to keep pace of what's going on and you know are the system the Keynesian the system that we have as far as you know printing money and causing inflation and stuff and all of our presidents even including donald trump have just been had the printer machine on they finally turned it off this this past administration a little bit, but they're like turning it back on. And I'm like, are we out of the woods yet? And historically, after they have started to stop printing money and they take that break, and then when they turn the machines back on, in a sense, we've had economic collapses. So I'm still kind of watching that concern that, you know, that's still an option, you know, but it, there's, of course, economics is a, a huge topic in and of itself but that's something to, to keep keep note of because even even though after he won we saw the market stock market you know skyrocketed 1500 points the next day and even and interest rates went up again and so i don't think even when powell first um you know added a couple points a few mo a month or two ago you know the the yields went in the opposite direction which would which is you know still still kind of concerning. So that's kind of what I'd like to see is, you know, him say, and maybe he has as far as, you know, balancing the budget because we live in a debt ridden society and that's, that's bondage big time for a lot of people makes it hard for people um, to, to function, you know, to, to be a part of, of this society because they're just, you know, spinning their wheels, part of that, part of the beast system. And like we saw when Trump came into office, the the dragon reared its head in a sense that people just started going nuts and going crazy and stuff. And it's though his words are somewhat inflammatory, like David said, people are genuinely scared whether we think it's legitimate or not. You know, that's their their reality. They believe what they have been told. And I think that's, you know, coming down to that listening aspect of hey, you know, it's hyperbolic. You know, you saw stuff on the internet. These women are shaving their heads and denouncing and saying all these things. And it's like, it's going to be okay. This didn't happen the last four years. You know, that's I said that on a Facebook post the other day. It's like deciding between drowning or burning. Which one do you want? You know, that's what the elections can be like. It's like, you know, we just ha have those two choices of, of which one you want. So, but I think people... We can, like I said earlier, it's like hyperbole and hyperventilated through through the internet, and we're just like, you're either voting for a communist or a Nazi, and it's like, well, no, it's probably neither neither one. There's aspects of both in each, I'm sure. But yeah, you know, Greg, you bring up a really good point on on the uh, the unemployment, 
And I think it may end up proving to be a little broader than that, but it changes the uh, money stream, if you will. The people that would be getting laid off uh, would obviously, it would change them pretty huge, but I think it may affect all of us and we may be in for uh, a bit of turmoil uh, in, in maybe a number of ways with you know, with change. Change is not always an easy thing. Yeah, transitions are hard. I can imagine that, you know, rooting out, if indeed this is uh, his objective and if indeed he does accomplish this to where he is rooting out, you know, quote unquote, deep state members, this is going to have a massive impact. It, it, I, it, just think of the body. You, you can't go in and cut out a cancer without some, uh, you know, downtime and some healing. And, you know, in, in some cases, even, you know, relearning things. So I look at this as cutting out cancer, and I hope it's true. Um, I see, I, I, I'm really struggling with this idea of the Great Tribulation and the time frame for where we are, because I can see tribulation coming. I mean, we're, we've been seeing tribulation with the conflicts around the world, with the uh, the, the, the the conflicts of information, um you know, things like that. So, I mean, there's been a lot of tribulation, depending on where you live in the world, you know, your, your tribulation is different. There's still places in the world where you can die if you have a Bible on your phone. Um, you know, there's, there's entire generations that have been lost because of conflicts in other places around the world. Uh, there's other places in the world where you, you can't, um, you can have a Bible app on your phone, but you can't, uh, you know, contradictory religions to yours are taking, pre you know, priority. I'm thinking of like England and Islam. That's, there's a rise of Islam in England and they're praying in the streets. Um, but you know, it's a problem if a Christian prays in the streets, you know, there's, there's all these things that are happening. So there's definitely great tribulation, but this looks like good, a good plan. This looks like progress going forward. And I can't help but wonder if this isn't our opportunity uh, as, you know, people who are the temple of God, who have God dwelling within us, if it's not our opportunity uh, to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. Like, this seems like the time to rise up and do that like never before. I agree with what you're saying, The, the this is the time to put our beliefs to the test. This is the time to lean into that structure that we know. I, oftentimes, I know the, the word of God shows God as a, a human being almost, where not human, but more with the emotions and with deciding fact decisions, right? Uh, when in reality, it's more of a structure. It's a structure that that we can depend on. And even when tribulation comes, because we have that structure, not lying, living within our means, paying attention to details, loving your neighbor as thyself, all of these different principles that we learn from the Word of God, when we act on those that structure, we can weather the storm, right? That that's what pulls. That's why we don't fear uh, that that darkness. We know, okay. It's going to be rough. The last four years were not a cakewalk for me and my family. Uh, there's six of us in this house, and uh, that three of them, three of the six are in college. So that's what that was wow. tough, right? And yet we buckled down. We're not going out to eat as much. We're, you know, we we stick to a structure that works. And the adversary has his structure. And that's the one that gets washed away. I think, too, like to just to put things in perspective, you know, think about World War II. Think about all the wars and stuff where like millions of people were dying. And, you know, we kind of have our little third world or first world problems. Right. You know, here here in the States. And I, I say, you know, we're all we can, you know, become uh, preppers and this and that and be concerned Armageddon's coming, this and that. Well, that's it's happening for people right now in Haiti. It's happening for people in Eritrea. So there's different parts of the world who people are going through uh, tribulation, going through their own Armageddon in a sense. And so like a lot of the things we see, 
it pales in comparison to what history has provided us as far as mass slaughters of, of people and genocides and stuff like that. So, yeah. Well, I think it's prudent to still make sure that you prepare. I, I don't know if I'm uh, going to maintain my preparations for three and a half years because uh, it's a lot. It actually takes a lot to maintain those kind of preparations. Um, uh, if you do the work up front, you can get that kind of stuff uh, sorted so that it'll last 25 years. Uh, we're, we're still at that point. We're still, you know, sealing stuff up. It takes a lot of work. Um, it, things could get bad. They really could. But I do know that the scriptures, uh, there's a promise to the Church of Philadelphia um, that they will be kept from the trials that are coming on the entire world. I, I almost wonder if maybe we're not in that pocket. Like some of us who aren't suffering uh, and and things are looking better, maybe maybe that's what's happening here. Like those who are, this is a time to trust God. I think if you trust God, even in hard times, you'll be taken care of. So yeah, there may be hard times coming. Uh, but it, I also see this as a uh, an opportunity. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, David. I, I was just thinking that the scripture that we have that we're referring to, that we see all this uh, reading in Revelations and throughout the Bible, it wasn't put there to scare us. It was put there so that we could read it and we could trust that there was a plan. That that we can look to it and say. Man, glad I made the right decisions. Glad I'm I'm going to keep making right decisions. And if I didn't make the right decision yesterday, I'm going to make it tomorrow. I'm going to make it right now, right? It's yeah. it's there it's there there's the the four different uh motivators, right? It's uh the acronym is RICE, uh reward, uh I, ideology uh, coercion and ego, right? Now, those aren't in order of strength, but uh, ideology, what I believe, my values, that's going to be the strongest. Reward will be second. Uh, ego would be third, and coercion would be last, right? So when we look at this word of God, we got to know that he put it there not for coercion, not for us to have ego, Okay, maybe there might be some reward in it, but in reality, it's what we believe. It's what we believe and what we act on each day. That's what brings about the blessings of God, and that's why we take the actions we take. Amen. Yeah, Amen. that's great. Uh, do you guys have any final words you want to say before we go? I'll say that I am, I am excited. I love being here. This is the great conversation. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. You guys are great. I was going to say the same thing. I, I'm really glad you're here with us, Dave. And, and this was fun. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, thank you, guys. I really appreciate every single one of you. I love this conversation. Uh, this is a conversation I think we should keep going forward. I want to get more specific uh, on uh, you know things that we can do to help others heal. There was a lot of stuff. There was a lot of learning tonight. Slowing down listening, being empathetic, uh, putting yourself in other people's shoes, uh, looking at things from the word. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of learning tonight. And I want to keep this conversation going forward and continuing to build that list. Uh, so we'll uh, spend some time studying this and come up with more, more that we can add to this conversation. But uh, we also have just to kind of plant the seed for next week. So we're uh, probably going to take the weekend off. Uh, we'll come back on Monday. I don't know if you guys are available on Monday, but coming into next week, we're going to, uh, we have some more information, some new information on the two witnesses uh, that Gregory is going to be presenting that is going to blow your guys' mind. Um, I don't know. Did you want to give like a, 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 a quick overview of that, Gregory, or should we save that for next week? Yeah, let's save that. I want to try to work out some of these uh, technical difficulties. Yeah, it's something you guys haven't heard before, unless you unless you follow Yas Blaine, because he, he did a video on this, I think it was a year ago, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's been, been a few months, a few months. Yeah, he did he did a video a while ago. It's, um, it's... I have one on, one on the one in Revelation and then um, in Zechariah as well. So it's two different. Right topic yeah 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 uh, so if you want to get a, a sneak preview go watch all of gregory's videos he's only been making them for five years i, I had one quick question 
Uh, sure. Dave, Dave, that's uh, is your book available where people can buy it? And can you share that information? Oh, yeah. Oh, heck yeah. I actually gave it to my kids to read. They read it, made sure that all the stories that I put in there about them, that they were okay with me sharing the deets. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it's actually the title of the book is Behind Mommy, In Front of Daddy. Uh, and it's a whole story about where that came from and how I use that little phrase to get my little ones in line and uh, get us to a place that was safe, walking through a parking lot behind mommy, in front of daddy, allowed mom to make decisions and know that dad was backing her up. And then in the end, it let dad be comfortable knowing that I could see where all the kids were. Jacob, stop pulling your sister's hair. Ian, stay in line with Gabriel, stay, keep up with mom. Uh, but it's, it's all on Amazon. You can look up behind mom in front of daddy. It's, I, I want to say it's, a, you could even listen to it, uh, uh, on, oh, now I forgot what Amazon is that allows you to listen to the books. Audible. Uh, Audible. Yes. So behind mommy in front of daddy. Oh, cool. Yeah. Go buy his book. I imagine it's amazing. Is it funny? Uh, yes, there are. There, it's all stories of how I help my kids learn about themselves and succeed in life. And it ends with uh, a, a really difficult time in my life uh, where I lost quite a bit. And my kids and my family are the ones who help me uh, because of those biblical principles. And the book was not written with chapter and verse. It's written with stories. But I guarantee you can find biblical principles in there if you if you've been studying, if you know your word. Uh, it's chuck full of the principles, and I it, I don't know. It makes me cry reading it. I love it. Oh, well, just just knowing you for geez, how long did how long did how long were we together? Like we were in college for three years. We uh, before that we did stuff. We went on an outreach program. Yeah outreach programs knocking on doors together yeah. yeah um david's one of the funniest people i know uh, so i can imagine there's some hilarious uh shenanigans in, in your book and uh, i really hope to uh to expose the world more to you because uh man i love you i love actually i love everybody in this room here tonight you guys are absolutely amazing every single one of you are meek uh well studied and have a deep deep respect for god uh and for the scripture so I'm so thankful for every single one of you guys. I'm looking forward to more conversations. So unless you guys have anything else, I'm going to end it on that. And we'll see you guys Monday. God bless you guys. Shalom, shalom. Thank you, everyone. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness that never and faithfulness, gentle and whole, self-control, guiding my heart and soul. These are the gifts planted inside, bearing the fruit of a life.